in the American Revolution, one of the cries and mottos of the Presbyterians was we have no king but Jesus. And um, so we recognize that Jesus is our king, but no one, no one else rules in our hearts like he does. Will you please stand for the prayer of illumination and the reading of God's word? You know, when a king would send his herald to make a proclamation, he would blow, they would blow the trumpet for everybody to hear, and then everybody was supposed to come and stand for the reading of the proclamation. So we stand for the reading of the king's word from uh, today from Isaiah 9 and, and Luke 1. Uh, but let's pray first. Lord, may your Holy Spirit come and illuminate in our hearts uh, the places where you do not rule, the places that we claim for ourselves. And help us, O oh Lord, to give those places to you, to have ears to hear your Spirit speaking through your word today in Christ's name. Amen. So today I'll be reading uh, these passages from Isaiah 9 and Luke 1. First from Isaiah 9, hear the word of God. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then from Luke 1, this is uh, really almost an Advent verse. Advent starts next week, but the idea of Christ as king begins today. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So there's a new Robin Hood movie coming out. Uh, so I was curious, how many Robin Hood movies have come out? In America, of, as, of all places, there have been 71 American movies about this English mythical figure who can shoot with a bow and arrow that we don't uh, hardly ever, except for a few deer hunters, hardly ever use. And, uh, and and we have this fascination with Robin Hood, who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. The figure of Robin Hood is probably a mythical figure, but there is some historical fact around this person of Robin Hood that's worth noting. And that is that uh, when Robin Hood was around, the king, King Richard, went on a crusade and while he was gone on the crusade, he put his brother John to be a steward of the throne until he came back. Well, when he did that, his brother John wanted the crown for himself while his brother was away. And uh, his brother Richard, the real king, the one true king, was captured by uh, first uh, a Polish king, then a German king. And King John, instead of paying the ransom to release King Richard, paid the German king to keep him a little longer in captivity. And Richard was a lion-hearted not only because he was brave, but he was a big-hearted man who actually forgave his brother when he finally got back to England after his mother paid the ransom. And he went back to the throne. The one true king went back to the throne, and uh, England was uh, ruled in a very good way while he was, he was on the throne. Um, so, the story of Robin Hood really is around the one true king coming back to the throne. And uh, interestingly, in last uh, 
century. There was a guy named J.R.R. Tolkien who wrote this trilogy, Lord of the Rings. And one of the books in there that became a movie is The Return of the King. And again, it's about this guy who was the heir to the throne, but he didn't want to reign. But finally, he came back to the throne. The one true king returned to the throne at the time when his people needed him to come and restore them and to save them from their enemies. And he deposed all those who were usurpers and pretenders and that kind of thing. Well, Jesus is the one true king. Jesus is the one who comes to his people when we are in need and rescues us as our Savior, but also makes his claim upon us that he is to be our king and he is to be our Lord. In fact, Jesus' claim, and it is echoed over and over again in Scripture, is that he is Lord of lords and king of kings, that he's king over all the rulers, no matter who is in the office of president or governor or the king of England or the king of Greece or whatever, Spain. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And really, if you think about it, God is the one who created everything that we have. And we are but stewards of all that we have, and so we owe our allegiance to him as our king. You know, deep within us, we have a desire for a king, a desire for somebody to uh, put on the throne of sorts. And it shows in America in our celebrity worship. When we, we, have, we put up all these people and we find their foibles, their problems, their sin after we put them up on the throne, but we put all these people up on these pedestals and then we see that they have feet of clay, uh, celebrity worship, if you will. And, you know, we, we readily put people up there. You know, I, I hear Nick Saban for president because he's a good coach, you know. We put all these people up and elevate them beyond their gifts and their abilities. But there is one whose gifts and abilities are fitted for his reign, and that is Jesus, who knows us and loves us and sacrifices for us. He is worthy of glory and honor and power and strength because not only did he make everything, he came to save everything, and he asks us to follow him in the good way, the way of truth, the way of peace, the way of hope for our hearts. He wants what is best for us, and so he calls us to follow in his way and away from our own way. The problem is that we're a broken people and that we find that we don't want to follow. We know deep inside we need him, but we don't want to really make him Lord of lords and king of kings of our hearts. Um, we don't want his demands upon our lives. Uh, we, want to, we want to acknowledge him as God and acknowledge him as Savior, maybe, but not acknowledge him as Lord and King. And this is our problem in America today. We have a kind of a nominal, surfacey type Christianity where we say, oh yeah, there's a God up there, but we're really not willing to listen to what he has to say to us. We really are not willing to follow. And uh, I can understand that. You know, um, we have these social media things, and, and in social media you follow people. So in Facebook and Instagram, and now there's Vero and Spotify, all these things, you can follow people. Uh, Twitter, you can follow different people. And I can tell you, if, if I'm following somebody and they're giving me too much information, the day I brush my teeth, the day I wash my face, the day I comb my hair, the day I cut my hair, whatever, you know, if it's too much information, I'm not going to follow them. I don't want to know every detail about that. It's too, too demanding. And, um, you know, we have a hard time following sometimes. And the same way with, with God, because God is asking us to pay attention to him. And we, we think we just want to go my own way. I want to go my own way and do my own thing and not really follow in God's ways, his way that demands of us. 
95% of Americans believe in God. We don't have a problem with saying, oh yeah, there's a God up there somewhere. There's somebody who made all this. It didn't just happen by accident or it's not just a chaotic mess. There's some design in life. 95% of us believe in God. Problem comes when God says, thou shalt not lie. Or the problem comes when God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Or the problem comes when, when God says, um, uh, do not commit adultery. The problem comes when, when God speaks and we don't want to hear what he has to say. The king makes a decree and we close our ears and we have selective hearing. I am on the throne. I make the decision about how I want to run my life. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm the pilot. I'm the king of my castle. God, you're nice and all, but don't tell me what to do. Let me go my own way. The Bible says this is what we do. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, what he's saying is we just tend to go our own way. That's what we want to do. We don't want to follow his voice. We want to do our own thing. So Herod uh, wanted to believe in God. If you, if you asked the people, does, does Herod believe in God? He, he would say he's not an atheist. But when Herod heard that the baby Jesus was born, he told the wise men, tell me where he's born so I can go and worship him. But what he really meant, so I can go and send my soldiers to kill him so there won't be a any competition to my being king of the land. We don't go so do that so drastically. We wouldn't kill baby Jesus. We would just ignore him and go our own way. But the good thing is the Lord is not just our king. He is our shepherd who calls us back to the flock, who calls us back home, who goes out and finds us and brings us back. And he wants us to know him, to love him, and to follow his voice and to uh, be blessed by him as our king, as our shepherd. We need a king. We, we absolutely need Jesus to be our king. We don't need to go our own way because our own way, if we're left by ourselves, it's like being raised by wolves or it's being lost boys in Peter Pan. It's like trying to raise ourselves up and not listening to anything about what is right and what is wrong. And there's a real joy that comes from knowing that God is our king. One of the great Christmas songs is uh, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth, let earth receive her king. There's joy in that. Let heaven and nature sing. That means let the stars and the angels rejoice, but let everybody on earth rejoice that there is a God who cares for us and cares what we do and wants to teach us the right way. The one who made us gives us direction. And if you have direction, you have meaning. And if you have meaning, you have hope and a purpose for your life. And along with that purpose is love and grace and forgiveness of sins. The king of love, our shepherd, is. He loves us. He is the king of love for us. Um, you know, uh, my uh, granddaughter turns two in a couple of weeks, and I've had the privilege and the interesting experience of sometimes observing her two-year-old day school class. It is chaos. But you know what? Every two-year-old day school class is chaos. Why? What do two-year-olds like to do? They have learned to say the word, no. No, I want to do it my way. I can tie my shoe. Oh, no, you can't. No, I will tie my shoe. And then five minutes later, you end up tying their shoe, you know. I can feed myself. No, you can't prepare your food. No, you can't eat ice cream all the time. No, you can't eat candy all the time. You know, they have to learn their boundaries. 
And uh, the sad thing is they have to learn to not be selfish. They have to learn to be giving and sharing and to wait in line and to wait their turn. These are things that we have to be taught. And the good thing is our day school teaches those things and teaches them about the love of Jesus and that, that God wants them to, to listen and uh, God wants them to care for each other. And in some ways, there's a part of us, there's always a part, no matter how old we are, that's like the two-year-old. We want to say no to God. I want to do my own thing. We want to say, I can do it myself. I don't need you, God. Stay out of my life. Let me, let me do it. And God's all the time trying to help us and to care for us. And we don't, we don't want it. But God is continually trying to say, I love you and I want to shepherd you. I want to help you. And when you realize you can't do it, I'll be there. The king of love, our shepherd, is. How do you know, really, if Jesus is your king or not? If he's really your Lord or not? You know, we say Jesus is our Savior and Lord. How do you know that he's your Lord? I have, I have three questions uh, for you to think about today. So, first ask yourself, is he my king or is he my consultant? There's a difference, you know. A king is someone you listen to. A consultant is somebody who gives advice, and you may take that advice or you may not take that advice. So if you have a grudge against somebody, and you know you have a grudge against somebody, and you know the Bible says to be forgiving and to love and to be reconciled, and you say, but this person is so bad. Did you not hear what they told me on Thanksgiving holiday? Do you take God's word as advice, or you take it as the king's word for us. Is God your king or is he your consultant? Second question. Um, is God your home or is he your hotel? You know, uh, the sheep, uh, the image of the sheep in the Bible is a sheep would go astray from the shepherd king. And they would come back to eat maybe, but then they'd go astray again like that's what stray sheep do. They come back to get nurtured, and then they go astray again. They come back. It's, you know, the difference between a hotel and a home, a hotel is a place you kind of go for a little while, and then you go away, and then you may come back if you enjoyed it. But a home is a place where you go for refuge and for peace and to be strengthened and for rest, for love. Is Jesus your home? Or is he just your hotel that you kind of wander away from and then come back to? I invite you to let Jesus be your king and not just your consultant, to be your home and not just your hotel. And the third thing is, is Jesus, are you just a fan of Jesus? Or are you a patriot of Jesus, a participant in Jesus, a citizen of his kingdom? And you're proud that you are a citizen and identify with his people. So yesterday was the big game, right? And uh, you knew I would say something about this. But uh, I, I, it reminded me, I was, uh, I was with a bunch of Carolina fans last night, and uh, for the most part. And I can remember when I was a kid, I, I, and a few times as an adult, I would go to, to several Carolina games. And uh, I'm a big Clemson fan, but my brother went to Carolina. My daughter went to Carolina. My great uncle was president of Carolina for a few years. Uh, there's a Sloan Library in the Carolina campus at Horseshoe, you know. And so there's some roots there. But so I'm a fan of Carolina until they play Clemson. So when I would go to these Carolina games, I would pull for Carolina. But I just couldn't wear the garnet and black. I just couldn't do it. I was a fan, but I was not a participant. And a lot of people are that way about church. 
Oh, I like church. Church is okay. There's nothing really wrong with church. But I'm not all in. I'm not devoted. I'm not going to be baptized. I'm not going to join. I'm just going to kind of be on the outside and just kind of see how things work and maybe get a little bit out of it and go my own way and not really be plugged in, not really work for the kingdom, not really do the Lord's work, not really be part of missions, not really be a part of the love or part of the family, be kind of on the outside looking in. So are you a fan or are you a citizen of the kingdom? Do you identify with this people? One of the great phrases that's found over and over again in the Bible is, I will be their God and they will be my people. So you're not just a a Christian individually. We're a Christian as a family, a part of a big family billion-person family. But I invite you to be a part of his family, to identify yourself, and to do the work of his family, the prayer work, the work of the church, the mission work. There's a great song, uh, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, and, uh, and My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. Those are two great songs together. And one of the phrases, one of the last phrases is the sh- of The Shepherd Will Supply My Need. The shepherd king cares for me and provides for me and watches over me, um, loves me. We recognize that God does that. And uh, one of the great phrases that, that ends in is this, No more a stranger, an outsider, nor a friend, not just somebody that you know, but like a child at home. That is my call to you today. Don't let God be a stranger. Don't let God just be someone you you know about, but be his child. Be a kid of the kingdom. Be a part of his family. Amen.